How you doing, man? Hey, Gunnar, how's it going? Thanks for coming on. You're welcome, man. Thanks for having me. I, I, I didn't know. I, I like. I thought this automatically kind of just joined me up, and you would see like a suggest. I didn't know I had to comment or something. I'm like, I don't know. I did earlier. I, there was some confusion about what time I had to be here. So basically, I was here earlier in the show, and then like, no, nah, it's your couple hours from now. So I went and worked out and came back. So here we are. So you're all pumped up. I mean, kind. I did last. So, not really. <laughs> <laughs> So, so congratulations anyway. on your uh, congratulations on your success and and turning your life around. You grew up in a ma- mafia family, is that true? Yeah, yeah, no, no. I w- grew up and see well, one of the interesting things about like the whole there's a the big whole like YouTube sphere that's kind of built around mafia, all things mafia, everybody mafia, but it's really fo- hyper focused on New York because that's where everybody knows things about the New York families and the mafia because there's all those informants. There's all the cooperators or or rats or whatever you want to call them. So because there's a million cooperators and informants that come out of New York, everybody knows about the New York mafia. But when it comes to like where I'm from Detroit, there are no rats. There are no cooperators. There are no informants. There's nobody parading around YouTube telling, you know, these (laughs) secret stories or whatever. So (laughs) except me and really, I don't really I, yeah, I don't really tell any um, – the stories that I share on my YouTube channel, which is Gunner Detroit, they're at least 20 years old when I was in the street or long, older, 20 to 30 years old. The FBI know about them. They're familiar with them. They've already convicted me of a lot of them. Um, some of them, they're past statute limitations. If they're not open murder cases, I'm way past statute. So I can talk about them. Um, I'm not like a lot of these guys who cooperated and testified then have immunity from prosecution from 50 different charges so they can go on YouTube and have a YouTube show and talk about murders and killing and robbing and stealing and blah, and then basically expose the entire mafia um, or family or borgata about it. So where with me, I grew up in a, in a family that's um, very, very secretive and very cloistered and quiet and very um, unique in the regard that. It's, you know, I hate to sound like it's just I'm piping, pumping up my own family or my own background, but I will tell you this compared to like any one single New York mafia family, Detroit is just much more powerful. And the reason for that is because they found a way to groom and kind of prepare assets. IEs, DEA agents, IRS agents, um, judges, prosecutors, city officials, government officials, union heads, union representatives, teacher representatives. And they keep them all in their pocket and they utilize them to their advantage to make hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars so they can control all the major rackets from street rackets like drugs and prostitution and things like that to the high level municipal contracts, government corruption, on and on and on. They can control all that. Um, but with a very small family unit, instead of having like 200 made guys where you have 150 of them are just kind of low-level wise guys who hang around pool halls and, like, you know, shoot dice and collect a few hundred bucks off their sports book a week. And then at the end of the week, they got to go see their skipper or their boss and say, here, boss, here's what I got to give Here's what I can afford to give you for the week. Here's a hundred dollars. That's all I can really afford to give you as tribute. Well, it don't work like that. And in, in so they got these guys that are really doing nothing in New York to kind of recruit them and have them as muscle. So they can, when, when the boss says, I need you to kill a guy or go pick this up or do that. Whatever they have the guy there and their strength in numbers. Where in New in Detroit, it's different. Where they make a guy, he's been in the family. He's a he's a blood relative, a nephew, a cousin, an uncle, whatever. And they he's been with the family 25, 30 years. And when he kicks up every week, it's kicking up a hundred thousand dollars or you know two hundred thousand dollars. It's not two hundred dollars, and it's only fifty guys that are made instead of two hundred guys. But those other 150 really don't count. You know what I'm saying? There's a, another 150, 200 guys that were like me, kind of just soldiers in the family that still earn, still kick up, still, you know, whatever. But they, um, but anyway, so that I grew up around that. My mother, by the way, so anyone who's confused, I'm sorry, I'm talking really fast. I know we're limited on time. But um, my mother was Grace Toko, Grace Carmela Toko. So if anybody wants to do like a, has any interest at all in kind of learning about me or the Detroit Mafia, if you just Google Detroit Mafia and Toko, the word Toko, T-O-C-C-O, it, then Pandora's box will open up. Um, the boss was Jack Toko. He was the boss for 40 years. Um, that was my grandfather's cousin, first cousin. And so I was raised in that family in that environment my, in fact my parents divorced when i was four and I went and lived with my grandma and grandpa toko um for years on most most of my life of you know juvenile life 
and then um, and I, you know, when I was my teens, I went out on my own. But, but basically, by the time I was 15 years old, I had been to jail a bunch of times, juvenile a bunch of times. I got expelled from school. I was in a ton of freaking trouble, fighting, felonious assaults, on and on and on, uh, stolen properties, r- destruction of properties, blah, blah, blah. And basically, all the old mob guys had been watching me since I was in diapers be a knucklehead. So by the time I got to be 18, 19 years old, they were like, well, he's one of us, you know, and then they said, you want to make a buck, you know, you, basically, you, you know, you're a street guy. It's what you are. You're not going to college. You're not going to be a, you know, a good guy. And so listen, you want to, I'll give you 3000 bucks to freaking crack this guy's head open. You know, he's been disrespecting me for a while. I said, 3000 bucks. I would have done it for free, but yeah, let's do it. And then I go do it. And then, you know, and then run, be, run, run poker games and dice games and security here and do this and do that and collect for bookies and loan sharks and yada, yada, yada. And it just never stopped. Until I was 29 years old when I was arrested and indicted for extortion and bank robbery and armed robbery. And, and the main reason that was, there was a whole story behind all that, uh, where it's really a lot of it, none of it really had necessarily had any involvement in organized crime. It was just, I was so out there at the end that I just was so used to doing gangster shit to, to, to survive um, when the family kind of turned away from me because basically my cousin Johnny had killed a couple of drug dealers that were based, the drug dealers were, were with another crew of, uh, mafia guys and i was seen with johnny and but nobody knew it except my uncle and he said bro you're you're gonna freaking get yourself killed if they find out you're with johnny and johnny killed these guys you're, they're gonna kill you and i can't do nothing to help you not to mention i got busted with two kilos of heroin and i ended up beating the case but everybody in the family thought i was a good they because i was out on the street they didn't they didn't arrest me for it they didn't. It was in. They was in my girlfriend's house. They found it, and they were waiting lab results and stuff like that. And I flat out told the detectives, "You don't have a case." I figured they would never charge me with it because they had nothing. Well, so everybody knew the raid happened. So they're all thinking, "Geez, he's on the street, two kilos of heroin." That's. I mean, how's he in the street? He must be ratting or something. So everybody was like, "Oh, I want nothing to do with you." So now I was out there. I was like, "I got to make money." I lost the two kilos of heroin. I had to freaking replace the money because I owed a wise guy, a you know, a gangster for the money. So I robbed another dope dealer of 100 pounds of weed to pay Angelo for the $200,000 worth of heroin. And so now I'm, this, this is the crazy life I was living right at the end, and then I ended up in prison for you know, all these crimes and stuff like that. Yeah, so what, 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 was, what was the family's relationship then with the other families, like the Gambinos, the Bonanos? What was your well, boss's relationship? So the families are, are semi-tied uh, together. Um, there's, there's always been a couple, so I think it was the Bonanno family, Priziola and, um, uh, Profaci families, um, which are kind of founding fathers of the Bonanno. And I, and I want to say Genovese could be Columbus. I don't know. Anyways, the family's married. Their daughter's married with a couple of our, our, our sons and a couple of our sons married a couple of their daughters and created this very strong bond. I do know Paul Castellano, which John Gotti killed, um, was very close with Jack Tocco. They had some mutual business interests. So the boss of Detroit was friends with Paul Castellano. And when they killed Castellano, Jack Tocco really, you know, he despised John Gotti. And he used to freaking say, why doesn't this freaking pussy Sammy the Bull kill Gotti and name himself the boss? But instead, he... so they didn't, you know, Jack Tocco was the boss for 40 years, died worth over a hundred million dollars, as the I believes. Um, only 18 months in prison when he got convicted of the RICO and being the head of the Detroit Mafia for 40 years, which we know he bought the judge. Everybody knows that. Even 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 the court systems and the federal prosecutors, they know he paid the judge. So there's no freaking way you get convicted of RICO. You know, they get freaking eight months. But so he because he first only got a year and a day, and then the, the prosecution that were in an outrage and they brought him back. Well, because of Jack Tocco's power, he was able to sweep it under the rug. There was no media coverage. There was nothing. And they're like, this is insane. We convicted him of Rico for being the head of the Detroit Mafia 39 years. We want to send him more time, Your Honor. He says, okay, I'll give him another nine months. <laughs> and they give him nine more months. And it can't. And then he came home. And that's the only time he ever did in his life as, as, a, as a, you know, godfather of Detroit. So that's the type of character or figure he was. I didn't know him that well. I knew him. I knew him. He, he was friends with my grandpa. It was his own body. They, they, they ate dinner and lunch and coffee and espresso all the time together. But when he came over, I didn't, you know, kick it with him. He was an old man like my grandpa. And I was a little intimidated by the guy. I'm not going to lie. A couple of times he, he kind of, he kind of checked me, 
about some things. Like one time he said my car was too flashy. He said I should sell my car. Another time he told me to lose my gold chain because I'm not a gangster rapper. You know what I'm saying? He's like, why don't you lose that freaking gold chain? You, you think you're a gangster rapper? And I was like, oh, okay. But he did. He said it was smart about the car thing. He said, lose that stupid cop magnet because I was getting pulled over all the time. You know, I'm going to jail and my grandparents had to bomb me out. And he knew it. And then I pulled up one day. Boom in my boom system and a black limousine tinted Mustang. Boom, 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 boom. And he happened to be there. I didn't know it. And I walked in. He says, he looks out the window. He's like, why don't you lose that effing cop magnet, man? And I was, I was like, yeah, good point. So I did. I bought a station wagon after that. You know, I had a motorcycle, a crotch rocket ninja, but that I got on the neighborhood station wagon and nobody pulled me over. I the cops didn't know it was me ever. You know? The Mustang was just like instantly, as soon as I drive down the block, and they pulled me over and I get arrested. So yeah, I, I bought a white Toyota Corolla, which fit nicely into Arizona. Nobody, you, you couldn't even notice Nobody, it. Nobody, yeah. yeah. So, what ready. what are your thoughts then on the big mafia YouTubers that we've seen rise up in recent years? Sammy the Bull, Michael Francis, and John Elite. I think the last mafia interview we did was with John Elite. Well, I mean, I've done. Listen, I. First of all, I've you got to watch Leo Leo and Longevity's podcast or, or show right now. He's a big got fifty thousand subscribers. It's a pretty big deal. And um, anyways, we did a show yesterday about that. And I'm one of these. So there's a big YouTube beef going on right now with all these people: <laughs> Jimmy Calandria, Sammy the Bull, my partner Larry Mazza, myself. And I, you know, I got a smaller YouTube channel. You know, it's only got six thousand people. It's relatively new. But we're, everybody's beefing and talk telling lies about each other and they're all the truth is they're all <laughs> cooperators i'm the only one who never read it so that's the thing i had a thing with sammy the bull i wrote the two i wrote the first two um episodes of his podcast um outlines for it you know what i'm saying and like and after that he kind of like treated me like i was like a redheaded stepchild he didn't want to talk to me after that because i told him i won't do it for free you got to pay me 500 bucks an episode which is not that much and then he kind of would treat me like a pariah so ever since then i'm like man f him anyways you know sammy the bull's nobody to me i respect michael francis though he's doing it right i he's supposed to be coming on my show he's got a great show he, he's professional he's just doing it really well and he's he's a gentleman i've talked to him several times via email um, now I've done zoom calls with Sammy, but Sammy, the bull still thinks he's a mob boss. So he's kind of, it's kind of a joke. When I talk to him, it's like, dude, you're, you're not a mob boss. You're a little old freaking man who works in entertainment with a podcast. Stop pretending you're a gangster. You're not, you lost your gangster card. Your gangster card got stripped when you took the stand against 67 guys, bro. Put all these guys away for life. Stop being a gangster. You're not a light was on my show a couple of weeks ago and it got tons of traction, thousands of views, but everybody hates him. So, I mean, there's so many people that freaking hate the guy. <sighs> why, why are they hating on him? I found him fascinating. I do, too. I think he's fascinating. I think they think a lot of his stories are embellished or, or not true. I think most of his stories, for the most part, are true. But he's easy to hate. He's a guy who's a tough guy, but he's not Italian. He's just like me. Easy to hate. They list, They look at my last name and see Limblum. Wow, who the frick is he? Mafia. What? Limblum's last name? No, my, last, my mother's last name was Toco. T O C C O. Google Toco and Mafia and watch comes up. Five hundred thousand hits. You'll see. So the thing is with A Light, it's the same thing. He's he's an Albanian. He can't be nothing. He's freaking. And then he's but the guy was running around shooting and killing people, robbing in in, in a huge coke dealer, getting huge money, and with the the Gotti crew. But people are dummy. A lot of these like fanboys and groupies. There's a lot of them, bro. There's so many like weird YouTube fanboys and groupies. They're just obsessed. They pick their their favorite guy, like a, a sports celebrity, like a soccer player or whatever, and that's their guy. And they love him, and they worship him. Picture on the wall, jerk off to him. They will – if you say one thing bad about that guy, attack. It doesn't matter what's fact or real. It's just like they will attack you if you say one bad thing about that guy. And the thing is, like, A-Light will call out phonies and fakes and frauds and, and call them what they are, and then they all attack him. So it's just it's a lot of goofy fanboys, you know. And we're talking about kids who live in their parents' basement. They never worked, lived a day in the street. They never did no dirt, picked up a gun, shot, killed, robbed, never made no money. Nothing. They play Grand Theft Auto, and they watch YouTube shows and, and, and read a couple of books. So they're experts on the mafia, they think. And then so they want to pretend that they're like this. And that, I want to say, you know that you're worshipping as your favorite mafia idol is a rat. You know that. And the number one rat of the ma uh, rule of the mafia, first one, never break the, the oath of Omerta. Never. So when you go on stand and rat, 
you have no right to pretend you're a gangster anymore. You can be an entertainer and tell stories, but don't pretend you're a gangster because you're not. And if you want to worship guys that are in the mafia because they were in the mafia, how about worship a guy like me who didn't rat? Now, you can listen to my shows and see I got 257 shows are, that – that are well, there's like 200 of my 250 shows are me telling these crazy ass street war stories. They're crazy as hell. They're basically gangster street stories, you know. And in the end, none of them ended with me ratting. It's just ended with me in prison for 13 years. So, you know, but my name isn't sound toco, my name doesn't sound Italian. And so they, and I'm not from New York, I'm Detroit. So, and I literally have people who say this like, Detroit. That's just some podunk backwoods, backwater city. And I'm just like, dude, Detroit has 4 million people. 4 million. A million of them are Italians. 1 million Italians in Metro Detroit, which is half the size of New York City, yes. But half of New York City is Puerto Rican and Asian and yada, yada, yada. So in the end, there's more Italians in, New- in Detroit than there are actually in New York. And, but they don't understand that. They're kind of clueless. And you've got some badass techno. But could you give us, we've got about 10 minutes left, could you give us a hard-hitting prison story, something you experienced or saw, something crazy from the prison years? Oh, jeez, there's so freaking money. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, just just pick, uh, pick one. <laughs> well, I'm a, here's the thing. So I never joined a gang when I was in prison. I was never in the whole, the whole freaking gang thing. Um, and it's, I just, I felt like I could walk the yard alone and not, you know, I was a, I'm a big guy. I, you know, I'm a muscle bound guy. I was before I went to prison. I had a good reputation. So when I, when I hit the street or hit the yard, every time I, I went to eight different prisons over 13 years, second, I hit the street or hit the yard, excuse me. Somebody always recognizing me from the street and they run over and tell their boys, you know who that is? You know who that, I know who that is. That guy's, you know, he's, dude, he was a heavy hitter. And he was a gangster killer. He was, I don't know, but by the time I hit the guard the next day, that everybody kind of knows who I am. And then so the guys who know me kind of introduce me to them, the gang heads. And those gang heads kind of point to the crew and say, listen, he's off limit. You know what I'm saying? Because if you bother him, if you try to extort him or press him or whatever, he's a guy, not only will he fight, probably beat your ass or, you know, fight with a knife, whatever, but also he's the guy who can call home and have your mother's head crushed in. So you don't want that either. So leave him the F alone. And that's what they did. So I walked the yard and one year, one year in Kinross prison, which is the second most violent prison in America, actually was the most violent prison in America at the time, 288 stabbings, two murders and God knows how many fights in, in the first eight months I was there. Um, very, very violent. It was an air force base that converted over to be a, um, um, a prison. So, one, I don't know, man. These guys, I knew these guys. They started. They're a couple of them were in my unit. They're like the Latin counts, and they're a pretty big gang. They're one of the biggest gangs in the yard, and um, and they started like a couple, I knew a couple of them, you know. And they're just like, you know, because I worked out. Everybody knew I was a good trainer. I was, you know, everybody wanted to work out with me. They like, train us, and I'm like, eh, all right, come work out with me in the afternoon. And and I said, okay. Before you know it, I got this whole freaking gang, basically, like, like eight of them are working out with me. And I really didn't like that because now the whole yard thinks I'm associated with these these guys, but I'm really not. I'm just working out, and they're working out with me. And um, and they were known for putting in work, you know, stabbing guys, whatever. And so one day I'm sitting there, and they, they come in there, and it was like – I think it was like a deadlift day or something. And I'm like, yo, they, like, a couple of them come in. They're, they're wearing their blue jackets. That's the first flag. Blue jackets mean everybody's trying to blend in. Like everybody, everybody's got the state jackets. Normally, you just have something else on, you know, sweatsuit or something. And I'm like, yo, you guys get the freaking weight. What are you doing? You're late. You know what I'm saying? Get this, get a bar, get this. You know what I'm saying? And they're just ignoring me. And I see them looking around all nervous. So I'm like, all right, something's up. I can tell something's going on. Something ain't right. But whatever. I'm just going to go about my business. And, that, you know, I'm just hoping it ain't me. Like, I'm hoping I'm not the victim here. <laughs> and all of a sudden, out of the blue, these freaking two kids, two of them smiley and shaggy, they just attack these two other guys that are in the weight pit and start stabbing them. And the one guy kind of folds up, what I do, what I do? And he's just like, wham, 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 stabbing them, blood squirting all over the place. And the other guy um, actually fought back. The other guy was like a kind of a muscle-bound dude. He, bang, bang, he punched the freaking Shaggy in the face and gave him a bloody nose, but Shaggy kept stabbing him and stabbed him in the face and the face and in the neck and just kept stabbing him. So... They fought for a minute. He's stabbed them about 20 freaking times. 
and kind of just the cops were right there. The, the cops had a guard shack about 25 yards away, but it was winter time, so they were in there just trying to stay warm. They weren't paying attention. They were, you know, playing grab ass and talking about their fantasy football stats. So that I mean, so the so the one guy stumbles off and like collapses. I don't think he died, but then, then the other guy went back to the cell and had his bunkies like duct tape all his wounds, and he got his knife and was gonna go back and try to find them. But they were like, listen, you can't beat them. They got a whole freaking gang. They're going to kill you. You go back out there, they'll kill you. So lock it up. You know, just check in, you know. And he did. That's just one of like a million and million things that uh, that I've seen in prison. You know, so, so you know, state prisons are absolutely brutal versus, yeah. versus the feds. Oh, totally. Like, like, totally. like you say, the violence is constant. So yeah. in, in Arizona, it's like the whites, the blacks, the Mexicans, the Mexican-Americans. You got the Aryan Brotherhood, the Mau Mau. Uh, you know the, the the new Mexican mafia, the the Mexican nationals. How is it divided in Detroit in the state prison system? The gangs. Oh, um, in Michigan, I think there's there's several gangs. You know, vice lords, Latin counts, but for the most part, you have the Nation of Islam, the Black Mobites, um, and then a few, and then the other gangs. But the Black Mobites, uh, they kind of are the most powerful and and most numbers. But they're also the weakest, generally psychologically and and mentally, and um, so I mean they did that they're the one, and they really don't fight. They're not doing a whole lot of fighting, stabbing, you know, hurting. They're just not. I I've, I've punked a few of them out, basically, flat out punked them, and they're just like, bro, what do you want to do? We can do whatever, and, and they don't do nothing. So they're really not into the. They're not saying they won't, but I had a friend named Rob Matty who got into it with them. Uh, and he stabbed like 30 of them over 12 years. He's a, he's a legend in the Michigan, in the Michigan system. Every time he get out of the hole, they try to stab him. He'd stab one of them out in, out in, out about every 30 to 90 days. He'd get out, they come, he'd stab, he'd stab, they stab, they back in. Back. And they, after like 12 years, they finally went to him and said, enough is enough, bro. We're like this, this is over, right? We, we, we can end this. Right. And he said, yeah. So the guy's a freaking living legend. He's one dude, this Chaldean guy who's an Arab, you know, an Iraqi Christian, um, who's a freaking lunatic. Um, basically pumped out the nation of Islam, which is, you know, 25,000 strong in the MDOC. Dude, pumped them all out. They didn't want none, but he, he was ready to kill them all. He just kept coming. He would have kept coming with it. Wow. What was the moment then? Was it re reflecting in prison where you decided to turn your life around? Well, I mean, as soon as I got arrested, man, I just like, this life ain't for me. It never, I mean, it, it, part, I was always trying to prove myself and prove my worth to the family, I guess, like, because I'm a half-breed Sicilian, what's called the Defetto or Dragoni, and I always had to try so hard to get everybody to accept me into the family and accept me. So I'm more violent than everybody. I'm tougher than everybody. I'll do this for whatever. I, mean. I don't care. It's all bullshit. Nobody cared anyways, you know what I'm saying? So when I got to prison, I discovered I had this talent for writing. Um, I just knew I had it. I just intrinsically knew, and I was in the hole for 17 months. And I started like creating these stories in my mind because I was reading books, and I'm like, these aren't that good. Like I can create better. So I wrote three books in my mind while in prison. Uh -huh. So I, in the hole, when I got out of the hole, I could get the writing, and I started writing. And over the next 13 years, I wrote, um, I wrote nine novels. And about halfway through my prison bit, I had this woman write me. Um, and she's like, Hey, I see on Facebook. Cause my cousin started a Facebook for me and said, I was a writer. I was in prison. Yeah. Yeah. This woman wrote me. She said, I work for a publisher. I know who you are. I actually went to school with you. You probably don't know me, but I don't know who you are. You're a bad guy. Yada, yada. I wasn't surprised you're in prison. She's like, but I see your writer. Maybe you can send me your manuscript and I'll check it out. If it's any good, you know what I mean? Maybe I can help you get it published. I work for a publisher in New York. So I said, great. I had my friend turn it into a PDF, send it to her. And then she read it and was blown away. She was like, holy, <laughs> holy crap, dude. She called me a unicorn. She's like, dude, you're the freaking unicorn, man. Like, you're, you're, you're the freaking unicorn of writing. So she started writing me and went back and forth. And basically over the next nine months, we fell in love through love letters. <gasps> and she waited six years for me and prepared wow. a life for me. So she wow. helped me. So so she prepared a life for me, waited six years. And the day that I got out, I my boys picked me up. We had party, gave me some gift. She They drove me to my girl who was making a big feast for me. I, you know, did what I would normally, and many man would do the first night. Woke up the next day, uh, went, got married, uh, married my wife, um, then got baptized in Lake Huron, uh, which is a beautiful crystal clear lake. And then I started my life, and it was just been a freaking exciting run ever since. Nine months later, I published my first two novels that I published, and the only books I published so far of the nine uh, to be a king, volume one and two, about a fictional mafia family. And the reason I published those first is simply because I figured I could use my history and my past to help, you know, market the books, and it's worked. So here we are. 
Congratulations then. So we're going to have the links below the description box for people to get your book and support you on your socials. What platforms are you on? How can people contact you? Well, so, and by the way, I also own our thing apparel. I just want to mention that it's got, it's kind of a, this kind of edgy kind of gangster. I like that. Yeah. 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 That's our logo right there. And it says our thing. And for every city, I sell a lot of it in Europe and you can get like London, our thing. If you can see in the back, every city, yeah. whatever, whatever city you have, it says, you know, the city and our thing in it. So it's pretty cool. And I sold plenty over there, but you can, you can, um, get my YouTube is Gunner Detroit or just Alan or Gunner Allen Lindblom. But Gunner Detroit should find me. And then my social media is the Instagram is Gunner Detroit. And my website is Gunner Detroit. Everything's Gunner Detroit. You just look up Gunner Detroit. Except my um, Facebook, which is Max. My personal thing's Max. But I have an author, Gunner Allen Lindblom page you can subscribe to. But it's Facebook. So I mean, I'm not big into Facebook anymore. It's kind of dead. But other than that, check out my YouTube. I share a lot of crazy and sting stories about my life before I went to prison. And, and I interview a lot of cool characters. You know, I, one day I got a radio show. I'm going to have to have you on my radio show. Yeah, I'd be delighted. And a huge thank you for spending time with us today. Please send my regards to John Elite. And um, to everybody You're watching welcome. this, all the links are in the description box below this video. So please go over and support Gunner's work. Thank and you, you, man. Yeah, you have we'll a have great... to do it again. If you want to do a recorded show, I can actually give you a lot. Like, like, I'd really get in depth with some of this. I think you know, I mean, get some meat. If you come, if you come to London, we could do a few hours in a in a studio professionally. If you ever get out here, I don't know if they'd let me sit. I don't even know if they'd let me walk into London. And they 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 probably would say, "No way, man, you ain't coming in." Well, <laughs> that was elite, my elite elite was out here, and Francis were out here. Oh really? If they let yeah. me in, they probably let me in then too, man. Yeah, Maybe yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, that'd be man, you take care. Yeah, man, that'd be good. Thanks for having me on. Cheers, my friend. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah, be, be Bye.